Thank you for inviting me here today. Among the many blessings of my life, I count my long-standing involvement um, in the rare disease community. For me, that started when I met some of you back in the 1980s when I was HHS general counsel, and we were working on the first orphan drug regulations that were very important, I think, in spurring an industry that allows us to have a meeting of this size. Shortly thereafter, the White House asked me to take the lead on implementing the accelerated drug approval plan that my old college friend David McIntosh had developed at the Competitiveness, at Competitiveness Council. That project led to the accelerated drug approval regulations of 1992, which, among other achievements, expanded the fast-track processes that had been developed for HIV tr treatments and, quite appropriately, uh, extended them to all diseases. The clear endorsement of surrogate endpoints as a basis for FDA approval was critically important for the development of orphan products. As you all know, small patient populations make it impossibly expensive and time-consuming to develop traditional clinical endpoints for many diseases. Life-saving treatments for rare cancers, autoimmune diseases, and genetic diseases would never have been developed, never mind approved, without these regulations. And although these regulations have stood the test of time for two decades, I want to commend the National Organization for Rare Disorders for prodding Congress to revisit and improve these rules. We cannot let the FDA drift away from the intent of the original rules. And we can never be satisfied with past successes and must always remember that tens of millions of people around the world are praying that we will approach our jobs with unflagging urgency. Um, as John Crowley mentioned, I've also had the great experience of working on five new approved products for two pioneering companies, Biogen and TKT. In 2003, when I was first CEO of TKT, I made the decision to junk two of our three technology platforms so that we would become exclusively a rare disease company. And in doing so, also tried very much to change the culture of the company in the ways that, that Angus outlined. Although this was um, much debated at the time, not fully supported by the board. I like to think that the fact that our stock went from $3.80 to $37 in just over two years before our acquisition, <coughs> I think that helped many skeptical investors at the time to believe that lean, smart companies could do well by both shareholders and patients. At TKT, we were a leader in protein therapies for lysosomal storage diseases. But it soon bothered me that we were leaving many patients behind because proteins do not cross the blood-brain barrier and many lysosomal storage diseases have deadly neurological symptoms. This, product was star this problem was starkly clear with our Hunter syndrome product where we knew if we were successful, about half the children could expect to lead fairly normal lives and half would die unpleasantly in their teens or early 20s. So, um, as Angus said, against the advice of many, we started a program in 2003 to try to circumvent the blood-brain barrier. And Angus is right, we weren't sure whether we could do it into the spine, whether we could do it directly into the brain, but we knew it was a long, slow process. Protein therapies, um, delivered into the, the blood um, are stabilized by a small amount of detergent and that detergent um, is um, an irritant to um, uh, the, the um, cerebral fluids and to the brain. So we knew that we had to, dev to devise a solution that had never been devised before. We had to find a route of administration um, that had never been successfully used before. We were leaning toward the brain, but had not ruled out the spine. And I'm glad that um, Shire took the time over what is now nine years 
to continue the very hard science um, that is still moving forward, which I didn't realize until quite recently. I ran into a former employee on the plane recently and got an update um, on the program. And I think it's tremendously important. It's not only um, hope for case, um, but it's the best glimmer of hope for patients with so many rare diseases, San Filippo, rats, uh, and many others. And so I do want to take uh, a moment to commend Shire uh, for its good work, but um, most more importantly for the, uh, the moral aspect of that, which is the persistence. When I returned to the Social Security Administration in 2007, um, an agency where I had wreaked some havoc in my reckless youth, um, I realized that I had one last opportunity uh, to try to make a difference for people with rare disorders. In 1985, my father was struck with the same form of glioma uh, that struck Senator Kennedy. Um, and I completed the Social Security disability application uh, for my father. Even though I allegedly was already an expert on the process, uh, the paperwork and the processing time um, was long, difficult, um, and frustrating. And I couldn't help asking the question, when the prognosis is so certain and so dire, why is all this paperwork, why is all this process um, necessary? So um, eventually I did pursue that. And the answer essentially was that a very large, very paper-bound system really constrained the agency's ability to streamline the process um, in a meaningful way. But when I rejoined the agency as commissioner in 2007, the agency had an almost completely electronic disability process ahead of other government agencies that do similar work, ahead of most foreign uh, countries that do similar work. And I realized that that provided us with an opportunity to do what was impossible in 1985. So we quickly developed computer screens for cases that on the basis of the nature of the disease, we knew um, sh pe these people should automatically be allowed benefits, and we now call those compassionate allowances. We also developed an algorithm to identify cases that are not quite there. They're highly likely to be approved 95% or more, but not certain, and we still need to follow all our regulations and statutory limitations but we call these quick disability determinations. Both these kind of cases are pulled out instantly at the moment of application, set aside triage for immediate review, and now they're decided in a matter of days instead of months or years. All these conditions, all these cases are orphan conditions. And prior to the implementation of these two new fast tracks, we had an extremely high error rate and an extremely high processing time, in part because of the error rate for those cases. The cash benefit that these people receive from Social Security is in many cases important to them. But as with my father, disability benefits are generally much more important as a gateway to health care insurance. Title II beneficiaries, which is our insurance program, um, those people become eligible for Medicare after a 24-month waiting period. For Title, VI, Title 16 recipients, which is our welfare program, otherwise known as uh, SSI, those people receive immediate access to Medicaid. Because of this link to health insurance, it is that much more important that we quickly allow benefits for applicants whose medical conditions are so serious that they obviously meet our standards, because in many cases they will not receive medical treatment while they're waiting. Right now we complete about 1% of our cases as compassion allowances and about 5% as quick disability determinations, and we do so in an average of 10 to 14 days and sometimes even less than 24 hours. We've helped over 150,000 people in this way so far, and that number is increasing every day. We expect to fast track 
close to a quarter million applications next year. Our success with the Compassion Allowance Initiative turns on sifting through tens of thousands of conditions in order to find the small percentage that meet the rigorous criteria for Compassion Allowances. Today we have 113 conditions listed as Compassion Allowances and our partners at NIH have been indispensable in helping us do um, this hard work. I think uh, Steve Groft is on the agenda today, who's been a real hero for us, so I'm asking you when he comes up to speak, um, give him an extra warm um, reception. The skill at, at NIH and their persistence have recently accelerated our efforts in an exciting way. To make a very long story short, NIH developed a statistical template of our 113 existing compassion allowances in order to identify other candidates for, their, uh, for the list. That work has been a spectacular success, and so today I'm pleased to announce our largest expansion ever of this program with 52 new conditions that will be fully programmed into our systems by August. And so I cannot applaud um, NIH enough. Um, I'm not going to take up the time to read all 52 diseases, but with any kind of luck, and I can't see them, they're going to start to appear um, on the screens on either side of me. Um, I encourage all of you to go to our award-winning website at socialsecurity.gov to check out the full list of compassion allowances and to check out our new mini-grant um, program. We are now providing small grants to graduate students who are analyzing uh, existing research and helping us to identify even more compassion allowances. Um, finally, you should also know that as of a few months ago, if you apply for benefits online and you have a compassion allowance condition, our standard vocational conditions and other paperwork will magically disappear and you can file with what amounts to a short form. As you can see, we've been looking for new ways to make this process easier and more efficient. Um, but the downside to our success is that it has become increasingly difficult to identify additional conditions. I challenge my small but wonderful staff to expand the list of conditions, to double it to 200 by early 2013. Um, today's expansion brings us two-thirds of the way there to 165 conditions, and we look to all of you for your best thinking on how we can add um, an additional 35 diseases to this list before the end of this year. During the networking break, um, I urge you to speak with the director of our Office of Compassion Allowances and Disability Outreach, Terry Dotson, who is here today. Terry? Yeah. Oh, there's Terry. There you are. Um, and you can also speak with our Acting Deputy Associate Commissioner for Disability Policy, Sherlita Stanton, who is also here over there. Um, 25 years ago, um, we probably would have had this conference in a room that would have um, just handled the five tables um, here in front. And so it is a great source of hope for millions of patients around the world that so many people with your talent and commitment are working on rare disorders with such urgency. So thank you for letting me speak to you today, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have.